All right, I bet you guys are sick of seeing these bad videos, but I just wanted to do a um, little walkthrough lab nine so that you know, you know, what you're supposed to do on this and you know what you should see. Okay, so I just want I'll walk through it like I would um, any other assignment, and so I've got it pulled up here, right? Oop. Lab nine, lab nine, my bad. Okay, so the first thing about this lab is um, its purpose. So the point of this is that you recognize different um, types of stream channels um, from headwaters to the depositional zone. And what you'll do is identify the major zones in two different rivers and learn how to um, look at stream flow data uh, as well as analyze it statistically. Okay, um, and then finally, you will be doing a little bit of graphing and work uh, working in Google Sheets or um, Microsoft Excel to do some pretty easy calculations. Okay, so what I will do now is um, just go through the stuff about Google Earth. So unlike Lab Seven, where you could work in Google Chrome, for this lab, you do need to download and install Google Earth Pro on your desktop. So I've included a link to that, all right? So if you click on that on the assignment, um, then you can go here and um, download it for your laptop. Um, and I think the directions are written um, such that it can work either on PC or Mac. They're slightly different from each other, but the directions as written are more PC based. Okay. So once you have got that downloaded, all right, the other thing you need to do is go on Blackboard and download um, two KMZ files I have. So a KMZ file is just some like a layer that you can add into Google Earth. So you need to have both of those downloaded. And then what you will do is you'll launch Google Earth Pro. And I'm just going to get rid of this um, so that you can see me open it. OK, so once you've got it saved somewhere and you know where it is, you can open it. And uh, to open, just open both of them, hold on Shift or Control and double click on both. Open both. Okay. And it's going to want to take you to Washington State, where your first thing is, but um, let's not do that. All right, so you've got that loaded in there. And then the next thing um, is you can uh, turn and toggle on off these layers, right? So uh, let's, so we have some layer in here, but you can just do that to turn it off, right? The other things that you can shift around in here are some of the other labels. Um, so you can put borders on if that helps you orient yourself, um, or roads. I don't think that's really necessary. Um, but you can toggle those sorts of things on. And then um, you can fly anywhere you want. So let's go to the First place, the Wairau Valley in New Zealand. All right. You can't leave your home, but we can go to New Zealand. Okay, so this is where the first part of the lab will take place. And um, an important thing for this lab is I try to do this on other assignments is that whenever I put something in bold italic font, um, that's your cue to answer that question. Okay. The next thing that you need to do is um, on Google Earth Pro is make sure the settings are right. So um, you do this by going into uh, Tools, Options, and then make sure that your latitude and longitude are in decimal degrees and that your units of measurement are meters and kilometers, right? We are doing science here. And then the other thing that you should change is the elevation exaggeration. If it's one, that means that there is no exaggeration, right? 
but if you make it a number greater than one, like 1 1.5, it's going to make topography look more extreme or exaggerated. There is a value to the, doing this in that it makes it a lot easier to understand differences in topography, right? So make sure those are set like that, okay? Apply, okay? Then you can get started on here. Um, I say on here to just leave borders and labels on uh, marked on here. You don't really need the places because it's just extra scattered. So I leave this very, very little on, but the terrain is important to leave on because that gives us our elevation information. Okay. So what you'll do in the first part of the lab is you're going to go to the Wairau River, which is this river right here, right? And you are going to go to its headwaters, right? And um, the Wai, well, just some background on the Wai River. It's a really pretty place in New Zealand. Um, Blenheim and Wairau is the Marlboro wine region of New Zealand. So um, this is a really fantastic place to visit because there are vineyards everywhere and really great food and it's gorgeous. So someday, if you can get down to the South Island of New Zealand, I strongly recommend coming here. Um, but in the lab, you can navigate to the um, to the headwaters, which I've given you these coordinates. Okay, you can just highlight and copy and paste that right into the search bar up here, and that should take you to where you want to start. So this is the headwaters of the Wairau River, and what you will do at this point is you're going to zoom in and start looking at the, what the river looks like here okay remember you can hold down the shift or control key and spin your mouse around so you can see the topography right so now you can see this is definitely exaggerated because um you know mountains don't actually look like that but it helps us see what um kind of terrain that a river might be flowing. So starting from this point, what you're going to do is go and draw a elevation profile. And the way that you do this is by going up to this little button here, add path. And then I would move, whoop, move that, move this over so you can see what you're doing. And then what you're going to do is you just are going to trace the length of the river. Okay. So you can kind of go like that. You can hold down the mouse if you want to do that. And you're just going to follow the exact channel of the river all the way down to where it meets the ocean. Okay. Now, you can do it click by click if you want. That might be a little bit less accurate. And if you make a mistake, so oops, I went off the river. All you need to do is right click and it will remove the last dot. So what if you're going along and you go, whoa. Just right click a bunch of times and it'll go back. Okay. So you will do that all the way down this river. And as you navigate, make sure that you use the arrow keys because your mouse clicker is being used to add dots. So if you like try to drag and pull over there, it's going to do that. So you need to use the arrow keys to navigate, right? So you're going to do something like this. Okay. Right, and you will go all the way down to the bottom. I'm not going to draw that whole thing because that would defeat the purpose. And I already did this once this morning for the other river that you don't have to do this for. So um, what I will show you now is what that will look like as an elevation profile. So when you reach the end here, name your path a Wairau River Profile. Click all right, and then in order to see an elevation profile, go over to the table of contents over here, right click on that layer, and then click on show elevation profile. This will give you the elevation from the starting point. So it's important to start at the headwaters all the way down towards the mouth of it, okay? 
when you get to the full length of this river, it's going to look really different. Okay, but this is uh, it'll look more like a really sharp drop off that'll level out, just like you saw in lecture 35. Okay, so that's how to do that part, at least in Google Earth, and. So as you do this, right, once you finish that, and you can, then you'll take a screenshot of the whole area, right? So it'll be all the way from up here to over here, okay? So you're going to have to draw and trace the river as best that you can, winding like this, okay? Right? Okay, all the way out to there. Once you've done that, you'll zoom out, take a screenshot of this path from here to there, and make sure that your elevation profile is underneath. And again, remember, it's not going to look like this line. It's going to be much longer and be steep, really steep, and then level out. Okay. So based on that profile that you draw, right, you are going to... You are going to annotate where you think the uh, erosion for the headwater zone, the uh, transform zone, and the depositional zone are on that river profile. Okay, and you'll answer some other questions, right? And you will be able to tell the elevation loss and distance from your elevation profile. And then what? is cool about this uh, about this approach to understanding rivers is that you can zoom in onto anywhere onto that river profile that you drew and see where there's a change in the morphology related to slope. So up here, this is a straight, slightly meandering stream, right? But as we go downhill and this valley opens up, we enter the transform zone because the channel it gets slight, slightly less steep and the channel width increases. And we can see these changes in slope reflected in the morphology of the river. Okay. So what you're going to do is you're going to find three places on your um, elevation profile where there's a change in slope. Right? So where it goes from gentle to more steep, or steeper to more gentle, and tell me what you see, right? And take screenshots, right? Then you will use the coordinates that you recorded in 1.7, and then go to Google Earth Engine, right? So let's just say, like right here, this is a good spot because it looks like there's a big change in the river morphology, right? You go from something that looks more braided to like a single stream channel, right? So you can get the coordinates by dropping a place mark and copying them into Google Earth Engine. Okay, so you can just follow this. All right, it's gonna jump to Alaska for some reason. It drives me totally nuts. Right. I guess it does not like little degrees. Okay, so don't add degree signs in there. All right now it's going to go into New Zealand. Okay. And remember, we were looking right about here. Okay. So I've got it starting in 1984. I'll speed this up so it's a little easier to see. And we can see how this river is or is not changing. So there's not a lot of activity going on in this part of the stream. But slightly upstream, where it's a braided river, you can see the meanders, meanders changing through time. Okay? Slow that down so you can see. 
especially right here. Okay, so there's definitely two different types of a stream there, and you just need to to show that to me. Okay. All right. So then, um, I'm gonna answer a couple more questions, and then you will go to the Skagit River in uh, Washington State. Okay. So for this part. I have kindly already given you a elevation profile. So you can go and click on um, this part. So open up Lab 9 Rivers. It's in here. And I will say go to here. So double click on Skagit River. OK, so I've drawn this out already. Okay, and you can see that it is going from uh, these headwaters up here in the North Cascades, really pretty national park, and then it goes downstream this way. And you can open up a elevation profile, right? And it's a little confusing, right? That's why I like to have it oriented so that uphill is always on the left. You can see how it's really steep in the headwaters, and then it levels out. Okay? So you will repeat a lot of the same things that you did in the first part. Um, but now we have the advantage of looking at another data piece. Okay? So the USGS um, is the United States Geological Survey. And they do many things um, for our country for um, modern science, but one of their biggest assets or biggest uh, part of their portfolio of duties is to monitor changes in stream flow in rivers. So around the country, there are thousands of tens of thousands of stream gauges that measure the discharge in rivers at multiple points. And what you're going to do in this part of the lab is look at different stream gauges that are along the Skagit River. And you can click on them. Okay, so you click on that, and it will say, all right, this is Thunder Creek um, near New Whalum, Washington. It's not the Skagit River, but it is a tributary to it. You click on that eight-digit number, and it will bring up information online, all right? And you can look at the stream flow graphs. So this will make more sense after I post the third lecture of the week. Um, which I will do Wednesday this week, but you can see how the discharge value changes um, through time, okay? Right? And you can then go to other parts of the river, right? So there's five, there's this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one down near the mouth, so get that one. Right. And we can see a different, slightly different pattern. Okay. And that's in temperature, but discharge is what we're interested in. So you see from April 6th up to April 12th, and there's a slight increase in this. Right. So you are looking at real live data. Right. So it's going to require a little bit uh, more thinking than uh, just like what is the right answer. Right. Okay. I know there's a tendency in science classes to be like, this is a fact, and you just need to accept it. A lot of earth science is looking at information and data and trying to think through whether or not it makes sense and what might explain it. Okay, So you'll look at these different gauges, and you'll record the discharge that's being observed right now, as well as the percentile. So, so like for right now, the instantaneous Stream flow is 10,900 cubic feet per second, per, per second. And so it is, uh, whoa, what's the percentile? Need to look at the percentile. You just need to know the, the uh, stream value. Sorry about that. OK, so then you'll 
think about your observations in the stream flow and look at individual uh, hydro hydrographs from several of these different um, hydrographs from each of these groups. Okay. Then you will work in the um, I have included an Excel spreadsheet in the Okay, sorry about that. So I forgot to upload one thing into this folder. It is the Skagit River Stream Flow data. It's an Excel spreadsheet. And what you'll do is you will open this. Okay. And what I have included in here are um, three different spreadsheets. In here. And what you will do in this part of the lab is you will learn how to make um, bar graphs. Okay. So if you have not made a bar graph before, all right, so I'll pull over this, all right, so to make a bar graph, right, or make any graph in Excel, you can highlight, right, and then pull down and select all the data that you want to plot. Okay, so made up that, and then you go to insert. Oop. All right, and then you can go over to charts and um, make a 2D column graph, and voila, okay. So what this is plotting here is the date on the x-axis, right? So that's the month of the year, and then the stream flow discharge on the y-axis, right? So you'll need to make a graph that looks something like that, and then um, figure out uh, when the highest mean monthly discharge is. Okay, and what that value is. So you need to look at the data. Where is the highest value? Okay. In this part of the lab, I've given you a, another graph. This is a box plot of the monthly measurements um, from this stream gauge station. And they show um, sort of the variability or how much spread there is in um, stream flow per month of the year. And so you see that some months, like uh, September, have a very low range of variability, and they also have a low um, mean value, right? So these x's here are the mean values for that month of the year. And you can see where it's higher in certain parts of the year and lower in other parts of the year. And you'll need to think about why that is, um, right? So think about different seasons and um, you know, where does water in a river come from, um, particularly in that part of the country? And then the last part, you will um, calculate a flood recurrence interval, um, as well as look at the peak stream flow data. So in the second spreadsheet uh, in this workbook, you can look at the peak stream flow that is organized by uh, year. Right? So this is the max value from every year. And you can make another bar graph here and plot that. Right? And you can see, oops, I am. You can see what the highest uh, values were, right? And pick out what the maximum flood in this record was. Okay. So you need to make a graph that looks something like that. And then at the end, you will go in and do some very simple um, calculations. So what you will need to do is in the third workbook, I've ranked the floods by their largest, right? And so the rank number one equals the biggest flood on record, and that was in 1990, okay? And then you're going to um, in this box here, RI for recurrence interval, you're going to type in the formula that I have given you. So what all you're going to do, right, is 
type in the total number of years on the record, which is 77, plus 1, which is part of the formula, okay? And then divide that by um, the t string for value, okay? That will give you a recurrence interval of that flood, and then you will copy that formula by pulling down when you get that little black cross in the, in the corner, okay? So I'll show you that one more time. Okay. So what you will type in is the number of years on record, 77 plus one, right? This is part of this formula, and then divide it by the ring. So to do that, you want to do it for each year. So you just click on um, the cell that you want as you're typing in the value, right? So 77 plus one in parentheses divided by Click on C2, then click Enter, okay? Then pull down on the lower right-hand corner when a little black cross appears, and now you have the recurrence intervals, okay? You'll make another graph, right? And you'll make another bar graph here. Um, and or scatter plot, and you will see how the not what I wanted to do. Sorry, I want it to be recurrence interval on the x-axis and the discharge on the y-axis. And this has it backwards, and you can change how you are plotting them by going into Edit Data Series and changing X recurrence interval and Y. This, okay. And your graph should look something like that, right? Y axis is the discharge and X is the recurrence interval. Okay. So then you will look at your data here and tell me um, what the recurrent, what is the magnitude, or sort the of stream flow of like a 10 year recurrence interval flood. Okay. This will make more sense up for the next lecture. But um, if and when you get to this point, feel free to ask me questions. Okay. This may be a little bit more of a challenging lab, but um, I think that as long as you guys contact me during office hours this week, I should be able to help you as much as I can, okay? Um, let me know if you have any issues, and I will do my best to help. Thanks.